Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre. With your host, Lonnie Scott. Welcome to Weird Web Radio. I'm your host, Lonnie Scott. It is an absolute honor to have you all here again. Thank you for tuning in and listening, sharing the show with your friends and your family. And I appreciate every little bit of help you have given me to get the word out about this show. As you know, we're in season three and it's been a little while since I've talked to an actual paranormal investigator who's strictly on those terms. This time we're talking to Connor Randall and Connor is a paranormal researcher based out of Colorado. He's been seen or will be seen on the upcoming Planet Weird series, Hellier, as well as on YouTube in the Dark Zone series, Spirits of the Stanley. He's the co-inventor of the Estes Method, a technique used for groundbreaking spirit communication. He spent four years as one of three resident paranormal investigators of the Stanley Hotel and seven years as tech manager for the TAPS, Family Colorado, Wyoming affiliate team, Front Range Paranormal Investigations. His approach to investigating the strange involves technical know-how combined with a modern-day take on various parapsychological and psychical experiments. If you want to know more about Hellier, I highly advise you go check it out. It's a project done by Connor and Carl Pfeiffer along with Greg and Dana Newkirk of the Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and Occult. You can go find that on YouTube, Amazon Prime, or even at hellier.tv. To watch Spirits of the Stanley, visit facebook.com slash team slash videos. Connor also enjoys playing drums with his band, Ghoulies, found on all major streaming platforms. I've checked them out. They're pretty good. You should too. And you can find him on Twitter and Instagram, at Connor J. Randall. Talking to Connor was a lot of fun, folks. I'm not going to lie. Um, we, we got into some interesting theories on the paranormal going back and forth of what we think is really happening uh connor actually reveals some secrets of the stanley hotel and its ghosts that you may not actually hear anywhere else i'm really excited about that and i really appreciate his um his willingness to share those stories and those insights and uh, of course we get into all the tools and techniques that he's accustomed to using i think you're going to really like the discussion on the estes method too Please remember that you can be a big help to the show by subscribing and rating Weird Web Radio on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or any other app where you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let the world know what you like and show some love. Share the show each episode on your social media outlets to get the word out to everyone. You can also gain access to the bonus audio sessions with the guests along with other fun rewards by joining the membership. Just go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio or weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership. It only takes $5 a month to get started. As I like to say, that is less than I paid for my caramel macchiato today. And that funding helps keep this show going and it helps it keep growing. And if you're looking for insight into your life and you're ready to get answers to those questions that keep pestering at you and bothering you and maybe even keeping you up at night, Maybe you just need some direction, some inspiration to get out of the rut and the stuck routine that you feel like you're in to break up the status quo. Listen up. I'm an international award-winning tarot reader, and you can go to my site, tarotheathen.com, to reserve your reading today and get all the insight you need. Answers await, my friends. That's all I have to introduce the show. Please sit back, relax, and get to know Connor Randall. Enjoy the show, my friends. Stay weird out there. Connor Randall, welcome to Weird Web Radio. It is an absolute honor to have you here, my friend. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here on Weird Web Radio to, to all of your listeners as well. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> hey, that was nice of you to welcome all them as well. I don't even hey, I, <laughs> I, I realize a lot of people are probably like, who is this guy trying to figure it out? So so I'm honored there. Uh, yeah, checking this out. I appreciate you on uh, inviting me. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. And of course, your time is greatly appreciated. And of course, uh, I think the paranormal community probably has an idea who you are. Uh, yeah. The occult community of which I have a fan base in as well, maybe not. 
but they're going to all know who you are by the end of this one. I promise that. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, since we dug into some of the things that you've done, where you've been in the introduction, um, I want to ask you, when it comes to the paranormal, since that's probably what most people know you for, mm-hmm. what did you think it was going to be like before you actually got started investigating with it? Mm. I thought before I really got started investigating, I thought that it was going to be a little less uh, background work, and <laughs> I, I, which I think a lot of people don't don't realize at first. Um, it's not handed to you on a silver plate. So I began my career um, at the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park, Colorado. Uh, and I joined up as a tour guide slash concierge, um, way back in the day, uh, because it was a haunted hotel and I wanted to be around ghosts and, and I sort of took a lot of it at face value, the stories and the things that I had read and was told and, and didn't realize that when I really tried to figure out the truth, I'd be going down completely different avenues. Um, and I thought I, you know, less, uh, freedom of, of information requests and government documents and things like that to try to figure out the truth there. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> That's nice. So you, you got involved um, in the Stanley probably as an adult. Would that be correct? I was, I was 17 years old. So okay. kind of, yeah. When I was okay. Old. So did something happen or did you have experiences before you were 17 that made you want to get involved in something that was, what sounds like a job almost. Right, right. It did. I, uh, my background in general, my childhood was very different from many other, uh, I guess you could say normal childhoods, um, because I had a lot of medical issues. Um, I'm actually a, a heart transplant recipient, um, which a lot of people don't realize. And basically, I underwent so much medically, um, And when I was in the hospital, things like that, uh, I started to, for whatever reason, I I had had some experiences when I was around 11, 12 years old. Um, And then I just started diving into it. I got into, of course, ghost hunters, like everybody in my generation who's in the field. You know, it was an introduction. And uh, I got so into the show. And then when I was 17, I decided to uh, really pursue it. I applied for the local ghost hunters taps organization group. I told them I was 18, but I was actually 17. (laughs) Um, And they picked me to, to go around with them. And, and then uh, I got a job at the Stanley hotel. So made the leap. Yeah. Well, well done, sir. Most people wait to lie about their age to get in the military. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) You went the other way around. Uh, (laughs) You, you, Brought up being a heart transplant there, and I'm just curious as a sidetrack, mm-hmm. have, there are stories about uh, people who are transplant recipients experiencing something related to the donor. Have you ever had an sure. experience like that? You know, cellular memory is a very real scientific fact and, and something that a lot more research needs to be done. In terms of my personal experience, I honestly can't really say so. But it's also tough because I was 13 when I received my new heart. So I was about to hit puberty. So who kind of knows, you know, what I would have been like otherwise, I guess, is is the thing. That's true. You're entering that age yeah. where our brain decides to go completely, uh, as I, I call it, uh, medieval warlord mode. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So. And. Oh, go ahead. No, I'll let you go. Ahead. I'll let you go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say. um Going back to the paranormal experience, you said you had a couple experiences that that ends up pushing you forward. What were Mm -hmm. one or two of your first experiences that convinced you that this isn't just something weird that you're experiencing, but it's something real? Right. When I was, um, goodness, 11 years old, I woke up one morning and uh, I saw a figure in my room, ran into my parents room um you know there's someone there there's someone there of course they walk in 
and my dad uh, runs in there and says, no, there's, there, you were looking at a laundry basket, you know, and then suddenly what, what was really interesting about that is that I was so scared that I actually, I, I was, I was just a, you know, I was a kid. I slept on the floor of my parents' room um, after that for probably a week or so. And it was then that I woke up and said, Hey, I don't, I don't feel very good. Um, and it was actually then that I passed out and it was then that they rushed me to the hospital um, and discovered that I had issues with my heart. So in a weird, in a weird way, I, I sort of think maybe, you know, what I saw was, was, was maybe, who knows, maybe a guardian angel type thing. Um, you know, it, it got me into their room and made me really start to realize that, you know, maybe I was sent there for a reason. Maybe something's going on. Maybe there's somebody on, on some other side looking out for me. Uh, and once you get bit with a bug, you just keep coming back. Of course, also at that same age, I visited the Stanley Hotel and I actually saw a door lock by itself, saw the whole latch turn. Um, and that, you know, like I said, you get bit by the bug and you just you just keep coming back like so many people who I'm sure are listening will agree. Mm -hmm. Now, did the uh, TAPS come first or the Stanley? Taps came first. Yeah. Taps came first. So what's it like to be part of a Taps crew? That's that's one that people have seen represented on TV quite a bit. But what's it look like when the cameras aren't with you? It's pretty interesting. The uh, way that it works, and you got to realize this was back in 2005, um, 2006-ish. Um, and so that was sort of when I really started to get into it. I was accepted around 2008, 2009, which really was kind of a heyday for ghost hunters, right? Um, and basically taps was so popular at that time that they were receiving thousands of case reports, um, on their website. But then what would actually happen is those case reports would be sent out to different sister groups around the country. And so me and my, you know, 17, 18, 19 year old self would, along with some other people who were a part of this, it was front range paranormal investigations. We would receive these reports and, um, we would show up to the, to the location first and basically kind of see what was going on. If we thought it was really crazy, we could pass it on to the TV show. But, you know, of course, 95% of the time that didn't happen. And, and we were sort of weeding through everything because I'm sure as a bartender, you realize everybody wants their, their bar to be haunted, um, you know, or their hotel to, to be haunted, things like that. And so, especially if it gets them on TV. So we had to, sort of weed through that. And I think a lot of people were surprised when this kid was showing up to their door with the, with some cameras and audio recorders and a notepad, you know, with some other people. And, and it wasn't Jason and Grant in the crew, you know? <laughs> uh, so that was, that was sort of my role there. Um, but it was a great experience. I did, you know, around 75, I counted, I think, uh, residential investigations. Um, and really, got to see a lot of different facets of how people react to the phenomena. Residential investigations carry like each place is pretty unique and what you're going to encounter, how people live in their own homes can be just an expression of what you might face. So right. what's your method of approaching a resident? So when I walk in, um, I do two things. So you walk into the location and first of all, I'm looking at their movie collection and their bookshelf, right? Um, I want to see where their mindset is at. Um, if they sort of naturally cater toward this, this kind of stuff um, or not um, can be really interesting. Uh, the other thing that I do when I walk in is I kind of sit there and, and, and I ask just a couple of questions, sort of like, you know, brief little, and you know this this game well too, brief little get to know you questions. Um, let's say, for example, they have, you know, a, a, a Broncos jersey on, on the wall, right? And you sit there and you say, oh, you know, you're you're big uh, Denver Broncos fan. And uh, if they say, yeah, yeah, big fan, and they don't give me a big answer or a story about how they became a Broncos fan, I realize that I'm going to have to weed some information out of them, you know, and, and kind of really be very specific with my questions. 
Whereas if they go on this whole story about how they were a season ticket holder for 20 years, um, then I realize that all I probably need to do is just walk in and say, tell me what happened. And they'll give me all the details. Okay. So you walk into a place and you see, um, uh, you see the book in the movie collection that suggests that perhaps they're into uh, witchcraft as an example. Mm -hmm. How does that change your approach in the investigation? It's funny. What I would definitely be looking for is the possibility of, of what um, is now becoming known as, uh, you know, something, if it's not necessarily that's, that's tied to the property, I would be curious to see if the activity is happening only when that person is present. If they are, for some reason, you know, that somebody who's into that might potentially, you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to, to stereotype or anything, but if there's some sort of intentional haunting or more focus around that, um, then maybe the activity is only present when that person's there. So if we're there for a weekend, I would have the homeowner be there for a night and then I'd have the place to myself for the night. Um, sort of be sort of where that's at. And that's not necessarily just witchcraft. That's say if they have all the ghost hunters DVD sets on the, <laughs> on the table, I'd, I'd react the same way. Right. If you're thinking about the paranormal and the weird, you could be drawing it to yourself. Right. Sure. Okay. So let's take it another route. If you, let's say the DVD collection is full of the history channels coverage of the universe, uh, Mishu Kaku's greatest hits, Brian Greene's <laughs> greatest hits on the bookshelf. And it's all physics and science. Uh, right there on the coffee table is uh, Darwin's <laughs> biography. <laughs> and he says, okay. and he says, this yeah. fucking place is haunted. Help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a totally different ball. Oh, that's, that's a, well, not totally. It's a, that's a bit of a different ball game though. Uh, you know, I, I might really try to, to get that person out of there and document <laughs> what I can, because I don't want them shutting down the energy, you know, of my efforts and in investigation with all their likely skepticism. Um, it would be, would be my thought. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can see a guy like that following you around saying, that's not what an EVP recorder is really <laughs> for. That's not what an EF, <laughs> right? the MF meter does. You know? <laughs> exactly. And, exactly. So speaking of, uh, what's in your toolbox? Where, what do you lean on the most? It's funny. I, uh, I am actually fairly anti EMF, uh, detectors. So I don't, I don't run any of those. I do have a tri field I might use in, in certain circumstances, but I, uh, I fancy myself more of an, more of an audio guy and, uh, more of an, uh, of course, an Estes method spirit box guy. Um, is really a couple of my go-tos along with a bunch of motion detectors. I always like those. Okay. Uh, so leading out of that, let's, let's go back to the Stanley. Cause we, we've mentioned the Stanley a couple of times and I'm going to assume right now that if people aren't Googling it, they may not, some people may not know what we're talking about. So mm -hmm. for <laughs> those people, what the, is the Stanley hotel? Stanley hotel. Um, so I live in the Denver area, right? And about an hour north of Denver is uh, the Stanley Hotel, uh, also known as the Shining Hotel, um, a great big grand resort up in the up in the Rockies um, that was opened in 1909, uh, and it has a very haunted reputation. Okay. Um... Where people or where might have people seen the Stanley before? They might. Well, The Shining would be a big one. The, here, the thing is, is though it's actually not in the movie The Shining. A lot of people show up to the hotel and expect to see the one from the movie. That was all sort of soundstage um, and actually some outdoor sets from Oregon. But it is where Stephen King started writing the book and was inspired to write the book because he was living in Boulder, Colorado, just down the hill at the time. Um, and that's where people recognize it most of all. It also is, of course, one of Ghost Hunters and Ghost Adventures' um, most favorite spots. I got to appear, you know, on on 
uh, the program there with, with ghost adventures. And then they also have all of the, uh, Dumb and Dumber scenes, a lot of people don't realize, were filmed at the Stanley Hotel. The second half of Dumb and Dumber is basically there. <laughs> so <laughs> so you might see it there, too. That's cool. I didn't even know that. Um, yeah. So you went to the Stanley, and you're a sort of uh, – the what, correct me if I'm wrong – the official, uh, what, ghost tour guide? Yeah. My uh, – I started as a tour guide, and then once they realized that I really liked the ghosts and uh, kind of dove pretty pretty deep into that, uh, and I sort of hitched on with a couple of other people, um, Carl Pfeiffer and a woman named Callie who was working there at the time, we uh, became the resident paranormal investigators of the Stanley Hotel. So basically, uh, three or four nights a week, oftentimes. Um, and it sort of evolved where, where Callie left from working there. And then it was me, Carl, a woman named Lisa, and also Michelle Tate um, from Ghost Hunters. Uh, after she was done with the show, she worked there too. We were a team of people that basically three, four nights a week um, would take people on an entire ghost experience. So it was a really unique job. The people were, or the, the hotel gave us equipment. And people would sign up in groups of 10 and they gave us keys to the hotel. And at nighttime, we just kind of went where we want and, and wandered and, and showed people how to investigate ghosts. Uh, how many people would typically be in one of those groups? 20 was usually the max there. The max. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So this, this rem brings me back to what you said about going into residential investigations. And you said you walk mm -hmm. in, you look for specific DVDs and book and what's on the bookshelf and get kind of get a feel for the sort of people that are inhabiting the place. So now you're leading a group of 20 people into an investigation to hopefully have some sort of an experience in the hotel. Did you find specific kinds of people were better for your group than others? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and of course, just by asking that question, I think you also sort of would be with me in this and that the the energy of the group in, in all of my experience and my four years doing that job at the Stanley Hotel is vital um, to the activity being present. So it's so funny. Carl and I used to kind of play this game and we would sit there. People would check in and give us their, their tickets and their money, right? Uh, and... We'd be like, okay, you're going to wait in this room with us. And again, I hate the stereotype, but oftentimes, you know, at least 50% of the time, uh, it seemed that there would be some guy, usually in his, you know, 40s or 50s, who would sit there with his arms crossed and was clearly dragged along, <laughs> you know, by, by his wife or something. And Carl and I used to look at each other and kind of shake our heads and be like, well, that guy's going to going to kill the energy. But if somebody like that wasn't present, the ghosts would would show up. That's interesting. Yeah, that, that somebody could be that big of a buzzkill for a whole group. Um, did you ever find yourself I, uh, experiencing maybe anywhere, not just a Stanley, but anywhere where uh, one person seems to be sort of the spark plug for the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mostly within the residential location realm. Um, what I sort of have walked away with the thesis thinking that there's not necessarily, you know, maybe three quarters of the time, it's actually a haunted person, not a haunted place. Um, and those people often have things happen to them throughout their life. Activity has followed them in various forms. Um, and for whatever reason, maybe during you know, highly emotional times, you know, both, both bad emotions and good emotions, that activity is, is more present. Um, and paranormal phenomena is more likely to occur to that person. Uh, but it, at the Stanley alone, uh, you know, in, in a trying to avoid sounding braggadocious, I like to think that the ghosts like us, liked us because oftentimes they would show up. If it wasn't at the group that night, maybe we'd be locking up and, you know, they'd stop by and say hello. We'd, we'd hear things. Things would move around. Um, 
when it was just those of us who worked there and were really into it. We we did have that happen quite a bit. Uh, how long were you at the Stanley? Uh, five years total. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Why would you stay there for five whole years? <laughs> uh, because it's haunted and it's very, very haunted. It's very, um, very haunted. So tell us who's <laughs> haunting the Stanley and how do you know? <laughs> I'll give you the, it's funny. Your, your listeners will get a, will get a lowdown that you're not going to hear on the tour of the Stanley hotel. And they probably wouldn't want me to say it, but I'm not working there anymore. <laughs> I can, I can tell you guys this, the, uh, <clears throat> the hotel in, in our findings, had a couple of different kinds of activity. There was, of course, residual activity because it's an old, happy place. Sounds of, of kids running up and down a particular hallway where the kids used to stay back in the day um, happened fairly regularly. We got to a point where we would document it or have people tell us um, about five times a month that they were hearing these kids um, in the hallway, would look out there and there was nobody there. And that was always a constant report, um, which was very interesting. In addition, the front desk staff used to tell us, you know, when people would call down and say that, uh, you know, there were kids and, and there was nobody there. They were complaining about noise and there was nobody there. So that's going on in terms of residual activity. In terms of intelligent activity, um, actual ghosts inhabiting the place, we sort of amongst various other, you know, spirits that we maybe, maybe were passing through and we weren't able to quantify. Um, we narrowed it down to three individuals, um, mainly at the hotel. Um, there was a, and, and a lot of our investigations took place in the concert hall, um, because it was at the bottom of the hill and there were no guests, you know, staying in there. So we had the whole building to ourselves. Um, which sort of helps, obviously, when you're not trying to investigate in an operating hotel. Um, but in that building, there were three ghosts. Um, Lucy, Paul, and Eddie are the names. Did you give the ghosts the you... names or did you discover them through other means? <laughs> they, yeah, they told us the names. The, uh, they each have their own little, little story. Um, so Lucy is uh was reportedly the go uh, a homeless woman who took up residence in the concert hall in the 70s um and who passed away from exposure um when she was discovered and and sent back out uh to to live out in Estes Park um she was there and she was a very friendly energy um she would giggle she would hum she liked to play with flashlights she liked to move things around um, and sometimes would, would give us EVPs and, and different voices, but most often it was music. We would hear her, we would hear her audibly humming. Um, you know, obviously it's hard to say frequently, but it would, it, you know, at, at a couple few times a year, things like that would happen. Um, which I know it sounds very rare, but it just amazed you so much. You keep coming back for more. What's interesting. And I can I don't know if you want me to go into this much detail. You can stop yeah. me, but uh, detail what, what's always welcome is, on this show. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we sort of set out because I was told when I started working there by the tour staff that there was a homeless woman who lived there and was kicked out. Um, her name was Lucy, and now her spirit has returned to the hotel. Um, in some ways, sort of a classic trope and mantra for a ghost story. But what we started to find in all of our diggings, because we wanted to find a picture of her, um, we wanted to put a face to the voice, right? Because it was, off, it was often audible activity. Um, and we started to find that that story is probably not true. And I bet you to this day, the tour guides at the Stanley Hotel are still telling this story. But uh, she, we couldn't find any death records. Um, police records, anything like that, of anybody who had died from exposure in the county during those during those decades. Um, in addition, we found that that building that she was supposedly living in, the building she was supposedly living in uh, on the property, was never condemned as the story that I was told 
um, was. Uh, so it was never condemned. You would think that they would know if there was a homeless, you know, young woman living there um, in that period. And in addition, uh, we spoke with the daughter of one of the owners of the hotel during that decade. And she said, no, that that building, they used to host meetings in there, like the Elks Club, you know, would, of Estes Park would have meetings in there. So safe to assume they they would have found, you know, this person's hideout. That said, it made it even more fascinating um, because the question becomes whoever along the line of the last 30 years decided to, quote unquote, make up this ghost story. Um, the point was, was that the ghost was there. You know, Lucy was there. She would respond to her name. Um, and so, of course, that that big question for us at that moment was, did we create this ghost, right? Um, who knows if we will ever find out the answer to that, but I always found that idea pretty fascinating with her story. Well, are you familiar with the term servitor or servitor? No. I know I always used tulpa in, in terms of that general form, but maybe you can teach You're along me. the same line, but a servitor is an idea that – probably influenced by Tulpa uh, lore that comes from chaos magic. Uh, the idea okay. that you can create a sigil that then gets focused on with intent and name and becomes a spirit with purpose, uh, an intelligent force in spirit with purpose. Now we can debate hmm. until we draw our last breath and never come up with the answer on whether or not we create that spirit or a spirit happens to be marching along and says, sounds like a fun job. I'll take it. <laughs> to take the name tag. Yeah. yeah. Right. But something clearly <laughs> happens time and time again when they th these things appear. And that, that's really interesting that you bring that up with Lucy at the hotel because, because you have EVPs or something, right. That she identifies herself. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so the question then becomes, yeah, exactly. Was that happened? The, all of the thousands of tour guides in the '90s and, and early aughts who who heard that story, all the all the thousands of tours who went through there, you know, focused on that as being a truth. That's that's a big question um, because the ghost was there. So so that's a good question. I wonder if somebody was just agreeing to be our ghost. I you know, and the, the the most curious part about it is is how do you figure that out? Or does it actually matter to know? Right. I will say this that helped to further add to this theory. We started to do that research um, within our last maybe year and a half at the hotel, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's when we started to notice her activity wane. Um, mm -hmm. And I wonder how much of that was influenced by our doubt in in that that story and in that spirit um it's somehow you fizzle the connection between you right right because when we started to find it because i always you know i i wouldn't have been able to sleep at night if i knew that i was just sitting there telling a lie to these people who paid me 50 dollars to go on a ghost tour you know um and so i wanted to know the truth so i i even started telling the public that um saying hey can't find her, you know, I, I don't know who this is. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Of course, at that same time, this is a good segue into the next ghost of the Stanley. Um, a spirit named Eddie started to show up and he has a completely different story because there was no historical, uh, pre, you know, precognition or, or, or pretense, I guess I should say for that. Eddie just showed up one day and stuck around. Um, and he would identify himself through EVPs and through various, various forms, mainly a smell, um, a really bad body odor smell at first, and then a sort of shifted into a better smell. But for a while, we just started calling him the smelly man. And then things would move around um, in the room after we smelled that. And then we would get various voices um, and usually a low tone voice um, saying the name Eddie. Mm. So and Eddie shows up about the time you you and Carl are researching deeply into the the real story behind Lucy. 
Yeah, yeah, those timelines cross. That's, that's pretty really well, interesting. Actually. So, yeah, <laughs> was Eddie in the the same area of the hotel? Mm-hmm. He was. Here's the thing, though. Eddie is. Uh, <laughs> I, my best guess is that maybe he was attached to somebody who went on one of our tours, and then he realized he would get a bunch of attention, so he decided to stick around. Um, but he is so cool because he's still there. I mean, and, and I don't mean there, I mean, like he, he hangs out sometimes with Carl and I, um, especially me, things like that. I, I will have activity happen around, around my home. Um, that is very classic Eddie activity. He's kind of a prankster. Um, things will move around from time to time. Uh, my, my, girlfriend my uh, poor girlfriend she when we had just been dating for about a month uh her bedroom door started shaking violently um and i had to sort of walk in and break the news to her that i have a ghost that hangs out with me <laughs> so so yeah will happen mm. and, then, and then you mentioned a third ghost that was living and you knew the, his name was paul okay. Paul was the uh, security guard slash maintenance guy who worked at the Stanley. Um, and he worked there from 1995 to 2005. Um, so we're talking fairly recent. And then in 2005, um, he was, as far as I know, outside shoveling snow um, and unfortunately had a, had a heart attack and, and passed away on his way to the hospital. Paul we classify him as an intelligent spirit because what we started to hear reports from guests and people were, were saying that they would hear a voice say, leave a really a, a sort of a deeper voice, say, leave, get out time to go. Um, but it, w- it would only ever be after 11 PM, which is the curfew for the outbuildings of the Stanley hotel. Cause it's a whole campus of buildings. Right. Um, and then the other thing is people would hear keys jingling and uh, footsteps walking back and forth during these, during these encounters as well. Um, I used to walk into the building and because I had keys myself and a name tag, he never really bothered me, but I honestly lost count of the number of times that people would, uh, would experience activity from, from Paul, the spirit. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, You know, as someone who spent, I mean, five years giving these tours and leading these in group investigations in the Stanley. And of course, I'm sure you get curious and go out on your own into the hotel as well. Um, how does all of this experience with the paranormal that you're having influence your just interactions in day-to-day life? It's funny. It's, it's a, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to, it, it's fine when, when, and I'm sure people will agree if, if, you know, your listeners are, in, are, are involved in this field, it's hard to get people to realize, um, the truth of, of this activity that, that things are happening to people, you know, just like, like you or I, just people out there living their lives, unexplainable things are happening. And this entire ghostly phenomena has such a, because of Hollywood tropes and, you know, of course, even up, especially up at the Stanley, the moving, the, sh- the movie, the shining didn't help out um, in that way sort of has this tongue in cheek um, sort of theatrical thing about it, you know, in the, in the global consciousness, but it's very real to, to a lot of people who once you, once you experience it, you're you're in that world and uh i guess my answer is that it's hard to have conversations with with normal people about about what you really like yeah <laughs> that's true uh but on the yeah. same note do you find people um sort of just naturally start telling you their ghost story yeah yeah they do there's um <clears throat> maybe 80 percent of the time you get the uh I guess I should say 20% of the time you kind of get the evil eye, you know, people are like, yeah, oh, 
Okay, that's weird. And then uh, they change the topic onto the weather or, you know, something, something baseball or something right. like that. But uh, 80% of the time, people have either a personal experience or an ant with a haunted cabin or something like that, you know. Um, and you gotta, and you got to sit there and, and, and listen. And oftentimes it's, it's the first time people are, are telling this story, especially to a stranger, you know. Um, so I always try to kind of take mental notes and then sometimes physical notes if I'm noticing correlations, things like that. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. good like that. You know, I, I think that listening to people share those stories because they don't come out of people a lot of times with very, you know, very easily. There's a fear of mm-hmm. rejection really attached to that. Not to mention you don't want people thinking you're crazy, but you know, right. you, you'll hear a lot, especially in the occult circles of people talking about this need to re-enchant the world. Uh, somehow that the magic and the wonder and the awe has been lessened or something. And I don't think so. I think yeah. it, the, the enchantment's all there. Uh, I just think people are really silent and quiet about it. And the work that you do out there leading groups and telling the stories and exposing people to yeah. the, as much as you can to the potential reality of even, you know, communicating with a ghost does right. wonders to keep that enchantment and that awe and that wonder alive in people. So yeah, you're doing good work even yeah. when you listen. I appreciate that. Thank you. You need to be reminded of that sometimes. Yeah, you're yeah. welcome. Now let's talk about the Estes method. I first saw sure the Estes method, probably like a lot of people did. Um, as a member of the B- Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and Occult, uh, run by Greg and Dana mm-hmm. Newkirk, um, wonderful people, wonderful museum, uh, former guests of the right. show, longtime friends. Uh, I will never miss an opportunity to shout their praises. <laughs> uh, yeah, I agree. But Dana is the first one I saw using the Estes method um, on video. Mm-hmm. And then I learned that it came from yeah. you and Carl, if I'm correct. So how how That's did correct. this whole method come about? So um the it's 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 interesting. One of the things that I really believe will um forward the field is taking older ideas that worked. Um, getting into older books and texts and things like that, um, especially in terms of psychical experiments and, and, and ideas uh, and applying them into the modern age, right? Um, we didn't set forth w- creating the Estes method uh, with that mindset, but that's sort of been my thesis afterward and my, and my driving goal in this field going forward at the moment. Um, but basically what happened was, uh, the entire method is a spirit box, um, which is the device that it will scan through radio frequencies at a very fast rate of speed. Um, and you take the spirit box and plug it into sound isolating headphones. Uh, and then you also isolate the listener in any other way possible, usually by blindfolding them. Um, and you have just that one person sit and listen to the box um, and repeat out loud phrases that they're starting to hear. They're fully immersed in the sound of the spirit box. And then you have everybody outside of, of listening to that feed. So everybody else in the room is asking the questions and trying to, trying to uh, sort of see if there's something going on with that. And you direct the spirit to communicate to or through, depending on which language you prefer or what, what sort of your path of belief is um, to that person and really try to get that direction there. The basic idea was founded one night when we used to use the spirit box, but we would use it out loud, just like so many other people do, just like they do on ghost adventures. And we would listen to it out loud. The thought sort of got irked into Carl's mind um, first that, well, 
we're kind of hearing what we want to hear oftentimes, right? So at that time, it was at that particular night, it was Carl, um, Michelle Tate, and myself. And Carl had some headphones in his backpack. And he said, what if I just listen to the box, right? And we had no idea when he decided to plug into headphones that night that we were creating this uh, experiment that's now sort of become a a worldwide phenomenon, you know, quote unquote, in the field that's uh, hopping all around the place. So, yeah, yeah, we just refined it from there and got better at it. It is a really cool method. Visually, even, it's a cool method. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't (laughs) Um, you know, religiously speaking, my audience knows this by now. I'm a heathen, meaning basically okay. I adhere to ideas and concepts, worship the old gods of the Norse and Germanic, uh, ancient Germanic people. There's things in the lore that survive in heathenry, uh, so in some of the sagas that talk about people using something called Saith. Um, sometimes to go in a trance and sometimes it's confused with references to other things. I won't bore you with all those details, but you'll often find uh, a method under which a practitioner is laying down or uh, somehow motionless with their faces covered, (laughs) going into some kind of trance state uh, to achieve something often in the spirit world. And, you know, anytime I see somebody, depriving themselves of senses to sink into an experience. It makes me think of trance anyway, as a hypnotist. Exactly. So yeah. I wonder, I'm, I'm, you know, as you're, you doing these experiments, I'm sure you've done hundreds of them by now. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you think there comes a point where you're not even aware anymore of what's coming across the spirit box that perhaps you've tuned in to some other deeper level? Oh yeah, that's, um, and I know uh, we already brought up their names, but when Greg Newkirk hears me say say this, he's he's going to giggle because uh, he's been convinced that's what's been what's been happening from the beginning. And I'm and I'm getting now to the point where I I think I agree that there's there's a point where I have done I have listened to the feed and practiced even in my own home, you know, um, for so many you know dozens and dozens of hours that uh, there's been a few times where you're just, you're just in another world. You really are. You're just, uh, acting as a, as a megaphone for what you're hearing. So it's, it's almost relaxing. Honestly, it gives most people a headache for the first five minutes and then they take it off. But if you really focus on it and sit there for half an hour, it, especially in like a rocking chair or something, I recommend, you know, it, it gets, gets pretty relaxing. Have you ever conducted the experiment to where, um, the one asking the question is far enough removed from the one hooked up to the box that yeah. you, you try to reduce the, the potential of all sorts of crosstalk. Right. Um, that's an issue that, that that was an issue from the very beginning. And that's why we started to number one, um, introduce the heftiest headphones we could possibly find. And honestly, I should be sponsored at this point, but I, I, I always recommend the Vic Firth, um, isolation headphones. They're used. I know of them because I play drums and, and, uh, we use them when we're recording drums. They, they block, you know, 25 decibels of sound from the outside room. So they're hefty headphones that you shouldn't be able to hear well through. But if you have a loud talker sitting next to you, it's possible that there could be a little bleed through. So, we always try to throw the people either on the other side of the room or a good distance away. To answer your question more specifically, we have tried varying formats um, there. One of the ones that we do is we actually have a baby monitor and we'll have the person who's the receiver plugged into the box on the other side of the building. And they, and they have a baby monitor playing where they are. And then we have the person who's asking the questions talking into the baby monitor on the other side of the building. So, um, and I'll say this, when we tried that, we haven't tried it too many times, but every time we have, not much happened um, in terms of responses. When we have the people on the other side of the same room, we've noticed more success. Mm. So data, data is inconclusive at this point. We'll keep trying. Have you ever heard of the Gansfeld experiments? I have, and I've tried it a few times myself. Um, 
there is some sim- similarities there. Absolutely. Yeah. The the reason I ask is because of the similarities in the practice. And but that was more research into ESP. Mm-hmm. A lot of that was trying to send a mental image. Yeah. Um, at this point, and a, a sort of a again an, another way that we could tweak it. What we're trying to do is get the spirits to send an image to us, right? Yes. Hmm. Yeah, I, I've watched the method enough times now, and I've even participated in a group experiment with you and Carl at Ashmore Estates. Yeah. Um, it it makes me wonder, uh now now I, Lonnie Scott of slightly chubby body, but pretty fucking awesome mind (laughs) hereby swear that I really think you're talking to spirits, but I can't knock the idea that there's some sort of like telepathy involved between question and answer at times. Yeah. And I just wonder how much you can experiment with that. That's a good question. Um, There, there really does seem to be. Um, we Carl uh, has had, had wrote out, you know, this whole, you know, maybe I'll, I'll ask him to send it to you. This whole like fifty-page thesis about different ideas of what could be happening, um, because we've gotten to the point where we have done this so many times, and people all over the community are doing this method and having success with it. Um, when they're doing it correctly, I have to be very specific that you have to do it correctly. Um, um, but they're, they're experiencing something, something is happening. And we have dubbed one of those theories, subtle sense perception. Maybe it's possible that somehow the subconscious of the listener is picking up on what the question asker wants, you know, to go through. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm always interested to see when I think they're talking directly with a ghost, especially a ghost that we know, like Eddie, for example, you know, mm-hmm. um, that changes and sort of quells that, that idea for me a little bit. Um, one of the, we also have a few things that we notice uh, that, that happen over and over again in good sessions. Um, and I won't give all three away, but I can say a couple of them. Um, because we want to make sure we're cross-checking every time we watch people do the method. We've noticed um, oftentimes that what will happen is when people really start to get into it, they will start to rock back and forth. And I'm interested to hear what what you think that might entail as a hypnotist. Um, when they really get into the feed, they start to subconsciously sort of rock back and forth. Um, is a, is a continuing theme. In addition, we have noticed that oftentimes the spirits or whoever we're talking with will actually narrate what's happening in the room. Um, so it'll be something like, you know, somebody for whatever reason reaches across the table. Um, they will say something like, you know, what are you reaching for? They will, they will be able to see what's happening in the room, but they won't be answering the questions directly. Um, we could be sitting there saying, please say red, say the word red. But instead of saying the word red, instead, they'll narrate what the people are doing in the room around them. Okay. Which irks me a little bit. <laughs> um, and I wonder if, of course, that gets into gatekeeper theory and all that. You know, maybe, maybe they're not allowed to give those direct responses all the time. Maybe they just have to tell us they're there in in other ways. Yeah, that could be. Um, I guess ultimately we'll, we can't know what the nature of their existence is and how their experience of us is actually unfolding. So that, that would certainly help in asking questions. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> but you brought up uh the the swaying the the rocking back mm-hmm. and forth um that it, that that's a common practice that you'll see not only for people in trance it's a common practice to achieve trance uh especially mm-hmm. in uh, more shamanic traditions um jan fries uh wrote a book called safe ways where he talks about it being uh 
not just swaying, but shaking even and doing different mm-hmm. things to get into those states. Uh, Aiden Walker, a former you- guest of the show, wrote a book called Six Ways, and he talks about you know, swaying and shaking and things to get into trance. So it's a thing. It's a real thing. Um, okay. I'm taking notes, by the way, Lonnie. I'm taking notes. <laughs> hey, good news. This uh, is recorded. Um, <laughs> uh, no, you know, and when I've watched, when I have watched Dana do um, these Estes mm-hmm. sessions on video, I notice there's always a point in there where she gets what in the industry some of us call the hypnotic mask. This is this is complete relaxation of the facial muscles. That I I you don't see it in people when they're sleeping. You don't see it hmm. in people when they're meditating. I only ever see it when I've got someone in hypnosis and I know they're truly experiencing hypnosis. And I hmm. see Dana in those videos always reaches a point when she gets that hypnotic mask. And at that same moment, you'll notice she'll start to rock back and forth. And that's what started making me think, you know, that constant rhythm of the noise in your headphones with the sensory deprivation from your sight is going to eventually plunge you into an experience of something you're not hearing in the headphones anymore. (laughs) It has yeah, to. It's true. <laughs> so, uh, it's true. there's a rhythm. Yeah, yeah. I really think it's a method that's also easing people into a trance state. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what we're the basic idea. And again, you know, we've, we've sat here and we've talked about it for 20 minutes and I think we're both, you and I are both reaching similar conclusions. What the overall thesis statement is that through the spirit box, um, and through the Estes method, um, what we're trying to do is sort of take down mental barriers and give people's mentality the permission to enter a state to listen to ghosts, right? So that's that's what we're trying to do. Hey, I dig it. <laughs> I told you. Uh, I don't think the world needs to be reenchanted. It's enchanted already. We need to open people up to experiencing it again. So yeah. nope. I think the SS method like is a great way to crack those heads open. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, so dubbed. If anybody's confused, it's so dubbed that way because the Stanley hotel is in Estes park, Colorado. And that's yeah. where we invented it. Yeah. yeah. I, I gathered that idea as you were talking about <laughs> Estes park. <laughs> yep. There you go. Yeah. Now like, we've, we can't name it after one of us. We've got to pick a place again. <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, we've talked an awful lot about what went right for you and the things that have been good, the experiences you've had. Um, now's a good chance to ask, uh, what what was one of the biggest mistakes you made along the way doing all of this? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think that there have been times when uh, I haven't been there quick enough to experience the phenomena um, or to, to be there in sort of a residential cases time of need, you know, um, it's hard to sit there and, and, you know, if you're an investigator in the field to sit there and be like, well, you know, maybe uh, I've got this free weekend in a couple of weeks, you know, I sort of have this mentality now where it's like, well, my, my bags are packed, you know, if something's going on, you know, I'll, I'll, be there because sometimes it is very fleeting, you know, these experiences and uh, you want to get as much as you can. In addition, another one of the mistakes to be uh, bluntly honest is that we, we didn't name the Estes method early enough (laughs) and uh, only began calling it that about a year and a half ago because so many people were doing it. And uh, we, you know, sort of selfishly, but also for our own, for our own interests um, and making sure that it's done correctly, wanted people to be able to get to us, you know, in order to, uh, to sort of continue the experiment and and we can have our own data. So we just kind of, you know, called it the spirit box experiment for a while. Um, and then, uh, more recently sort of decided to, to give it a, a name, 
a direct name. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, better late than never. Um, better late. So <clears throat> considering the uh, paranormal community, paranormal investigating, things you've been doing now for quite a while uh, with a ton of experience, what's controversial in the field? Hmm. What's controversial in terms of, of ghosts or just something going on, whether it's in ghosts or in the field, what, what do you think is something controversial in the, in the paranormal community or experience? Um, the, the largest thing, sorry, you can no, go ahead, please answer it as it is. <laughs> <laughs> the immediate thing that crosses my mind is a uh, provocation of spirits, right? Um, being mean to ghosts, yelling at ghosts. Uh, that's a major controversy that has been spurred by, by a particular TV show that I actually enjoy, but I won't <laughs> name that person. Um, and in addition, the other controversial thing is that, uh, that ghosts are scary. And uh, oftentimes they're not. I think that paranormal, and to be, to be honest with you, I think that paranormal TV in general is is a controversy um because we when you're not there to experience so much it's hard to take a lot of of quote unquote evidence at, at face value right? right um and so and and it's the same thing with any sort of viral video or any video that or, or picture that people send me you know i always give I try and give kind responses, but in reality, the back of my mind, it's like, well, I didn't take this picture. Um, I, I don't know. I can't tell you, you know, for sure. Um, it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard. Okay. Uh, what would you say are your own personal key principles of investigating? The key principles of investigating are <clears throat> documenting the stories, but um, going in with another trusted investigator who doesn't know the stories because you want to be able to cross check that. Um, that's a key, I think, to, to any sort of investigation. People need to get rid of preconceived notions of what the haunting is before they walk into the location. Um, if I'm going to a place, uh, I oftentimes won't read about it. I, I won't you know, find out more information until after I've left um, to see if my data and what I experience cross checks with that. Um, because I realize some people might think that's a little bit of a backwards way to do it, but it works, makes sense in my mind. Um, but the key principles in my mind are um, <clears throat> really do careful documentation, um, know your equipment, and also be polite to the ghosts and say please and thank you. Those are the three things I would say. <laughs> I, yeah, I can. I'll I'll agree to all of that. Actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially you. being and, nice uh, to the ghosts. Please be nice to the ghosts. Nice to the ghosts. Yeah. Um. You. I and I don't. Uh, I. I just think that this is also a, a PSA to get out there. Um. In terms of my second pillar, there. Know your equipment. There are so many people out there and so many TV shows for the, for years have, have jammed it down our throats that, that EVPs are the recorders picking up things that we can't hear with our own ears. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, when I dove sort of deep into audio research, um, you start to look at the frequency response of recorders. And it's no wonder that the scientific community has doubted a lot of sort of EVP phenomena in general, because the actual truth is that the frequency response of nearly every recorder available, especially handheld on the market, is well within the human range of hearing. Um, the question completely changes then. Why is this recorder in my hand hearing a voice, but I'm not? Because my ears are actually better than the recorders that I hold in my hand. Um, so you have to know your equipment, know how good of a recorder you have, and try to figure out exactly where that voice is sitting is, is something I'm trying to do as well in my 
my mission. Hmm. You know, you bring that up. That's an interesting point. Um, I used to be a DJ. I understand a little bit about audio and I've always been sort of perplexed by EVP, but yet the evidence kind of persists. Mm -hmm. It's, it really does. They're still there and, and try both. You know, I've reached the conclusion that somehow I think that the spirits are willingly imprinting a voice onto the device not necessarily creating something in the air that we just can't hear, you know? Um, it's something about that. And so I'm trying that. I'm trying, you know, it, I think people need to try ca- more cassette recorders um, because that's always intriguing. Uh, so I've been trying to get into that as well. So, yeah, yeah. that's a cool way to experiment with it. You know, I, I wish I had an answer for how these things happen. I have my own pet theories. <laughs> we all... <laughs> I want to hear them too. What's that? Go ahead and shoot your theories out as well. Oh, well, you know, when it comes, to, I'll keep it short. This isn't about me, Connor. This is about you. Um, oh, the, okay. uh, I really, because I'm an animist at heart, meaning that I just see mm-hmm. this spark of spirit or soul or something everywhere. I think we're just a, another spirit surrounding, surrounded by an entire ecology of spirits, human and otherwise. So um, the thought that we have to go to a place like the Stanley Hotel, while I do understand that and see it as a special sort of place, isn't necessary Mm -hmm. to experience um, spirits or the paranormal. Um, And we were talking about people, you know, can be the buzzkill or they can be the battery. I think some people are just going to be the thing that turns up the potential for phenomena in a place, whether they know it or not, they just operate on the right frequency. Objects can be the same way. I've never been in the new Kirk's home, uh, but I can imagine that Mm -hmm. that place hums. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Just, just hums and not with evil intent or even good intent, but just potential. It has this great potential. So, you go into a place or anything with uh, the right object or the right person and it's like the lights come on and you'll just have a better chance of something imprinting on that recorder or the doorknobs being rattled or doors opening and closing or, you know, the various phenomena. I don't necessarily think that a spirit is opening and closing doors or intentionally trying to speak into the recorder. I think they're just talking or weird shit just gets amped up in the environment because the right kind of, I don't know, potential has arrived, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Can I put a, a bit of a metaphor to your theory and, and see if you agree? Um, so I, and, and it's sort of the same way. I imagine like a, you said you were a DJ earlier, right? So, so imagine a record, the record of the haunting, quote unquote, you know, this, this record that is, the the ghostly activity is constantly spinning you're saying that it just takes the right person with the right energy to be the needle that goes down Mm -hmm. on that record in order for for the activity to become apparent in our reality absolutely yes that's absolutely right you know it's it's coming along with the right set of glasses that helps a dog see a rainbow you know (laughs) yeah i love that i love that but but metaphor yeah. that's awesome see these are the things that keep us yes up at night, yeah right? yeah 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 you're absolutely right <laughs> <laughs> well uh connor this has been awesome you're an this has been great you're an absolute pleasure to talk to um thank uh, you i really honestly hope i can get you back on the show and soon because i know there's a project out there where i'll talk about next time um <laughs> yeah. uh, but We've come to the end of the usual broadcast, so I don't take up all the listeners' day and time. Um, Yeah. Is there anything that I haven't covered, something you've got going on, uh, you're working on, or you wanted to talk about that I didn't get to? No, I I really appreciate you hearing out my ideas. Um, Yeah, I have a couple of websites I might want to plug. Please do. Um, And we'll close it. So, so. One of the things that we have an upcoming project um, that uh, we've been working on with the Newkirks and 
sort of the teaser and all the information for that can be found at acbtf.com. Um, ACBTF is that website there. Um, yeah, in addition, I am I'm getting ready uh, just uh, in about a week to launch my own little Facebook page. So if you want to find Connor Randall, Paranormal Researcher, I'll be on there. Uh, and then I'll, uh, of course, be in touch um, with anybody who has any questions. I'm, I'm always down to talk about this with anybody. So shoot me a message uh, anytime. That's awesome. <laughs> um, other than how people find yeah. you, uh, which we just covered, uh, do you have any parting thoughts or message you want to share with people? No, I want. Well, I just want to say uh, to everybody uh, to to keep reading and and looking at uh, at some old experiments and old ideas. Um, to give a little bit of homework, if I had to, uh, to people who are interested in audio phenomena, uh, check out the work of, of Constantine Radova um, and his breakthrough uh, textbook from back in the day that that created the foundation for a lot of EVP and work. And um, you know, of course, uh, also check out um, as much as you can about the equipment that you're using, and, and don't be afraid to to try experiments with good intentions in your own home and uh, you might be on to the to the next great thing, and and I want to hear about it and, and try it with you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And um, we had a little audio hiccup, folks. So uh, thankfully and hopefully, this all works out. Hey, um, it's, it's the Men in Black, like you said. You check out that's that. Right. I gave the shout out to the website for the Alien Project, and the Men in Black came in. Next thing you know, we get unplugged. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, folks. Thank you, as always, for being here. I really appreciate you. And go hit that like button, subscribe button, uh, rate this show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere where you listen to your favorite podcasts. As always, stay weird out there, my friends. Okay, gang, that's a wrap on this episode of Weird Web Radio. Once again, thank you all for listening. Now. It's time for you to go join the official Weird Web Radio membership. Go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio and you can choose your rewards and become a member today. Enjoy all the exclusive benefits, inside information, and plenty of bonus audio with each guest. Now, you can find the show at weirdwebradio.com and weirdwebradio.lipsin.com. The show is listed on Facebook and Twitter as Weird Web Radio. And you can find me on Instagram as just Lonnie underscore Scott. Please remember to rate and comment and share the shows that you like. And it helps others find us in all the search results. Shoot me an email if you want to be a guest on the show or if you know someone that would be a great guest in upcoming episodes. You can send that to weirdwebradio at gmail.com. Seek the mysteries and delights in life, my friends. As always, stay weird out there. (laughs) 